Welcome to another episode of The Chef Educator, the show that provides and discusses various teaching tools, tips, and techniques for the culinary, hospitality, and pastry arts educator. And now, coming to you through the airways from Palm Beach County, Florida, here is your host, doctor, professor, and chef, Mr. Colin Rowe. Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Chef Educator Podcast, a proud member of the Food Media Network. My name is Dr. Colin Roach, and I am your host. Today's episode is titled, Presenting Naked. Now, before we start on today's topic, I want to give a little background information on the podcast for all our new listeners. The Chef Educator Podcast was created to be a resource for the new and veteran culinary, baking and pastry, and hospitality educators out there at both secondary and post-secondary institutions. Each episode, we try and provide practical and effective teaching tools, tips, and techniques that we can all use in our classrooms and labs. And if this is of interest, please follow and subscribe to the podcast, which can be done for free on your favorite podcast app or through our website at www.chefeducator.com. Today, I want to talk to you about how we, as teachers, can be better presenters, whether that be in our classrooms lecturing and teaching our students or presenting formally at a conference or or to our colleagues. The ability to stand and deliver a powerful presentation that engages the whole minds of our audience members has never been more important than today. The ability to speak passionately, clearly, and visually is more important today than ever before, partly because of the fantastic reach that our audience, that our talks can have, largely thanks to the power of online video. What we say and what we present through audio or visually, right, today can now be captured easily and cheaply in high definition audio or video and then broadcast around the world for anyone to hear or see, just like this podcast or on our YouTube channels. And the potential for your presentation or your speech to have an effect goes far beyond just the words spoken or that are on your slides. Now, words are important, but if it were just about words, you could create a detailed document, disseminate it, and that would be that. But an effective presentation allows you to amplify the meaning of your words. For example, let's talk about any PowerPoint presentation that we have all sat through as audience members at one time or another. One where the slides are packed with content and the presenter proceeds to read each slide to us. Of course, we can read the information faster than it can be told to us. But this is an example of an ineffective presentation. The one that is carried out daily throughout the world. A presentation like this is missing the depth, and the richness necessary for it to be an effective presentation. Part of an effective presentation is the visual impact, and that could be the visuals on a slide or the visuals of us, the teachers speaking, right? This visual impact and the show and tell aspect of it. The presentation, the visuals, and the structure, as well as the story, they're all compelling aspects of a presentation which are all needed to make it an effective presentation. As humans, we are wired for face-to-face communication, a process that has been fine-tuned by millions of years of evolution. That's what made it into this mysteriously powerful thing that it is, this communication. Someone speaks, and from that, there can be a connection with all of the people that are listening. All of those receiving brains taking that information in. And then this can cause the whole group to act together. This is the connective tissue of the human brain, the super organism in action, which has driven our culture for millennia. So today, I want to share the contents of two books on this subject with you. They are both older books that you can pick up on Amazon, super cheap, like four or five dollars. 
Now, though they were written years ago, the content is still very applicable today. I have had both of the books for years, and I just recently reread them for a new food presenters course, courses actually, that I am creating, which, are, which shows you know, how to do an effective cooking demo for TV or for YouTube or even for a live audience. It's kind of like media training for the culinarian. And I'll put the links to these courses in the description and the show notes so that if anyone is interested, you could find out more about these courses. My plan is to create six of them. I have three already created and I'm working on more. So I'd love to, you know, get you guys to take that and get some feedback if you're interested. Now, the two books that I've used for this courses, the part of it, and that I'm going to talk about today are titled one, I See You Naked by Ron Huff. And the other is The Naked Presenter by Gar Reynolds. And I also put the links to these two books in the description or show notes below in case you want to get information on them or even maybe in this talk will inspire you to pick up copies for yourselves and learn more about it. But anyway, as it's at its core, presenting naked means connecting and engaging with an audience, whether it be two people or 2,000 people in a way that is direct, honest, and clear. Naked means putting your audience first. It means being transparent and taking a chance by allowing yourself to be vulnerable and exposed. Being naked involves stripping away all that is unnecessary to get to the essence of your message. The naked approach embraces the idea of simplicity, integrity, and passion. The approach feels fresh, perhaps even a bit informal, and it is often described as far more satisfying to both the presenter and the audience because your true natural personality gets to shine through. In other words, one who presents naked feels free, free from worry, free from anxiety over what other people may or may not be thinking, free from self-doubt, free from tricks and gimmicks and the pressure to pull those tricks and gimmicks off, free from hiding behind anything, including slides, and the fear of possible exposure that accompanies such hiding. The naked presenter removes all of these encumbrances, and is totally in the moment, and engages with their audience. And if multimedia is used, it fits well within the talk. It's harmonious with the message. Any visuals used would be simple, well-designed, and in sync with the talk. They would never, never, never steal the show, but instead would play a strong, supportive role that helps engage the audience. Now, presenting naked, however, is... It's not natural. It's unnaturally and it's, it's, it's hard to do because we're not in the habit of doing it this way. Now, but it wasn't always this way. When we were younger and we performed, say, a show and tell in elementary school and in front of our class, as kids, we were honest. We were engaged. Our candor sometimes even made the other kids laugh, right? And the teacher may have even blushed. But it was real. We told great stories, and we were only like six years old. Now, we are experienced and mature, and we have advanced degrees and deep knowledge in very important fields, and yet, we are most often boring. Now, one reason we are so dull as adult presenters is because we are overly cautious. We're not that six-year-old anymore. We are afraid. We want everything to be safe and perfect. So we end up overthinking things and we put up a ton of barriers. We also retreat, maybe unconsciously, and we play it safe behind, like hiding behind a PowerPoint or a keynote slide deck with their bullet point lists, void of emotion, which we often show in a darkened room, right? Takes the light off of us. Well, sometimes we even stand behind a lectern while we're given the presentation. Think about all these barriers, this, this cautiousness, this being afraid. And this is pretty much the accepted method of presenting today. After all, no one ever got fired for just providing information, right? But 
if our audience is asleep or if they tune us out, our list of information serves no purpose. It is ineffective and it's sort of a waste of time, right? And here's another problem. It's tempting to think of presentations or our presentations like a performance. Often we are our, we, often we are actually on a stage under the lights, standing in front of a group of people waiting for us to deliver the goods. Now, while there are some things we can learn from performers, such as dealing with nerves and how to project our voice and so on, it is much better to view the art of presenting like a conversation. Most communication experts today agree that a good talk or a good presentation should feel more like a conversation. They suggest the conversational approach rather than delivering a speech-like performance. We need to stop thinking that every time we stand up to say something, we are making a speech because we are not, right? Even though we may be professors, we're not professing all the time. What we are really doing is having an enlarged conversation. What we really want to do is have an enlarged conversation. And to do that, we need to make connections with our audience. To do that, we need to break down the barriers. It's hard to connect when you stay at a distance or behind barriers. It's hard to connect when you stay at a distance or behind barriers. For example, don't stand behind the lectern, right? The podium. It just accentuates the feeling of I'm up here and you're down there. What we really want to do is communicate with our audience, not just talk at them or worse, talk down to them. Get close to your audience. If you can reasonably walk among them, like we can in our classrooms most of the time, then do it. Especially, you know, if you can, and if you can reasonably walk among them while still making yourself heard, like we can in most of our classrooms, then do so from time to time. In the book, The Naked Presenter, they also talk about taking off your armor and to lay down your weapons. In other words, presenting naked is about taking off your armor, putting down your sword and shield, and facing your audience man to man, as it were. It's about removing that which is there for the benefit of the presenter and not for the benefit of the audience. It's about being authentic, being true, and being you. A fighter attempts to win by hitting their opponent and hitting them hard. Likewise, many presenters hit their audience with a flurry of facts and they bludgeon them into submission. Presenting naked means putting down your weapons and realizing that your aim is not to persuade people that you are right and they are wrong. But that's a temporary achievement. Sure, it's easy to bombard the audience with facts, but it's not effective. And if you don't aim to communicate effectively, you shouldn't be presenting at all. Start not from what you know, but from where the audience is. If you need to change their minds, help them realize they need to change their thinking. It needs to be their thought process that triggers the change. Connect with the audience, connect with the students, show them a new direction and help them want to explore it. Now the book goes on to state that perhaps the hardest part of presenting naked is taking off your armor, your comfort and your protection. They suggest the first thing to remove is the crutch of referring to notes on your slides. Instead, they suggest you prepare properly so that you never need to look at the screen behind you. Equally, your slides, if you need any, should be stripped of anything unnecessary. Make them simple and clear and ensure they are relevant to your message. And the next piece of armor to remove is your agenda, the comfort of knowing what comes next. Like a wise warrior who changes plans on the 
like a wise warrior who changes plans on the battlefield if their original plan isn't working, a presenter needs to be flexible and adapt to the situation and the audience. Also, cast off any self-importance you might have. You are not presenting because you are important. You are presenting because the audience is important. It's hard to make a connection with them if you put yourself on a pedestal, right? You are there to communicate, not to impress anyone. Finally, the book suggests that you let go of your sense of self. Again, you are not there for yourself. You are there for the audience. You have no personal aims or cares other than to communicate your message effectively. You have no worries that people won't like your style. Just be yourself. Be authentic and care deeply about the audience. Trust that the rest will take care of itself. And it will. Now, as mentioned, one of the keys to a natural conversational approach includes removing all barriers to natural communication with the audience. These barriers might include reading off notes, standing behind a lectern, failing to make good eye contact, speaking too softly, or using jargon or language that is formal and stiff and fails to appeal to the audience's emotion and natural curiosity. Another point the book brings up is that no matter who you are, or what your background or profession is, whether you have a technical or a scientific background, whether you're in business, whether you teach school, whether you're a student, there's no excuse for being boring. Now, some do believe that many technical professionals and scientists are naturally dry, boring speakers who are unable to communicate the relevance of their work to the greater public. But that is not so. They too can inspire and inform audiences through their natural conversational delivery style. Okay, I want to take a quick pause here at this halfway point in the show to tell you about what I think is a great resource for the culinary or hospitality teacher. And that is a book titled Culinary Educators Teaching Tools and Tips that's published by Kendall Hunt. I co-wrote this comprehensive resource specifically for the new and the seasoned educator. And it's written in an easy to understand style with numerous charts, templates, and examples throughout. And you can get it in both electronic and in hard copies for around $40. Well, if you're interested, you can get more information on this book as well as purchase a copy through publishers Kendall Hunt's website at www.kendallhunt.com. That's K-E-N-D-A-L-L-H-U-N-T. And of course, I'm going to leave the link to this in the episode's description so you can check that out later if you'd like. And if you do buy it, I'd love to get some feedback on it. Tell me what you think. Okay, now back to the episode. So here are six tips from Sir Ken Robinson on public speaking. He is not only an educator and an expert on creativity, but he's also a dynamic public speaker who almost always presents without any multimedia whatsoever. I had the chance to see him speak and present live and in person at a local university near here where I live, and he was phenomenal. His ideas on creativity and education and his own personal presentation style are truly an inspiration. And if you ever get a chance to check him out, please do. He's one of the most popular TED presenters ever. So if you want to see one of his presentations, whether it be live or you can do it on the internet, just Google his name, Sir Ken Robinson. You can look on YouTube. He's got speaking presentations on there as well. It'd be worth it. Check him out. He makes you laugh too. Anyway, here is a summary of his six major points on the subject of public speaking. Number one, remember, you are speaking to individuals, not an abstract group. The size of the audience doesn't matter, says Robinson. You are always speaking to individuals. So speak as naturally to a large audience as you would to a small group. Number two, be as relaxed as possible. People will feel relaxed if you, the speaker, are relaxed. So be as relaxed as possible right from the start 
to put the audience at ease. Seems like a small thing, but actually pretty big, pretty huge. Number three, be conversational and make a connection with the room. But also, he mentions keep your energy high. Being relaxed, natural, and conversational does not mean that your energy as a presenter should be the same as when you're chatting with friends in a coffee shop. Robinson says he gets a lot of his energy from the audience. So making that connection is very, very important. If you have the connection and the energy, it's, you know, you feed off each other and the impact of your message will be so much more effective. Number four, know your material. Okay, this may seem super obvious, but If it is, then why do so many people use detailed notes when they're presenting? I think partly it's due to nervousness, right? Or that's the way they've always done it, or that's the way they were taught, or it becomes a habit. But often also, Sir Ken Robinson points out, it's because people are not fully prepared to be taking on the topic, right? Not At least not yet. If you know your material well, you should not need much more than a few bulleted points on a paper, kind of like an outline to remind you of the structure of where you're going. Robinson says he thinks long and hard about his talks and writes down a few bulleted points on paper, not on the screen. Another thing he recommends is a mind map. A you know, mind map on a piece of paper can also be a useful reminder and kind of a road map for you. Robinson never uses extensive notes, just bulleted points. If you know your material, you will be relaxed. And if you don't, you'll seem nervous, and which will then make the audience nervous. So again, know your material. Number five, prepare but don't rehearse. He says, yes, think and plan ahead, right? That's what you should do. Number five, prepare but don't rehearse. Think and plan ahead instead. There's nothing wrong with rehearsal, of course, but different people have different methods for preparing. But the danger in rehearsal is that it is possible to seem too rehearsed when you present. That is, you may seem too perfect, too inflexible, unnatural. And though technically perfect, you may lose that ever important natural connection with the audience. Number six, leave room for improvisation. Number six, leave room for improvisation. He says that he always thinks of public speaking as being a, a bit like jazz or the blues. He explained that he does not always necessarily know exactly what he's going to say, but he believes in stories. His presentation, like a jazz musician, is telling a story and he is taking people someplace. Yes, he has an idea in his mind before he takes the stage, but like a good jazz blues musician, he feels free to improvise. And this is actually more natural and more flexible and enables him to engage more with his unique audience. Ken Robinson also believes in humor, which he believes is important for stimulating creativity. And humor is good for getting people engaged with you and your message. He says, if they're laughing, then they are listening. Now, Apple Steve Jobs was a good example of someone who presented well also, but he used the help of multimedia in an engaging style. And it's true that he had good products to talk about, you know, all the different iPhones and things along that line. But he also was an incredibly skilled at presenting those products. Now you can go back again, YouTube, Google, and you can see some of his presentations that he did. And they were very well, they were effective and very well polished. Now, great content is a necessary condition, but it is not sufficient. Jobs had both solid content and excellent delivery skills. Again, go back and watch him. Here are a few lessons we can take away from his presentation style. He says, develop rapport with the audience. Jobs usually walked out on stage, all smiles, without without any formal introduction. It wasn't a big thing over the PA. He just walked out. He showed his personality, which is confident but humble, on stage. And people are attracted to confidence. But it must be confidence combined with humility. 
Jobs used natural movement on stage, used eye contact and friendliness to establish a connection with his audience. He also said, give them an idea of where you are going. Now, you do not need the, you know, the famous agenda slide that we're always taught to do, right? The first slide is what we're going to be doing in bullet points. Now, instead, give people an idea of where you are going, a roadmap of the journey you are taking them on. In Steve Jobs' case, he might give a simple welcome, build a little rapport with a humble, oh, thank you, glad to be here. And then boom, he would say something like, I've got four things I'd like to talk to you about today, so let's get started. So that was kind of his agenda to let you know. He might, he might not say what those four things are, but just knowing that there are four major points or four major parts of his talk helps the audience. And he often structured his talks around three or four points with one theme. Okay, he didn't want to get too much information in there. We'll talk about that shortly. Another thing he said was to show your enthusiasm. Now, you may want to curb your enthusiasm at times, but most presenters show too little passion or enthusiasm, not too much, right? The appropriate level of enthusiasm can make all the difference. In just a few minutes on stage, Steve Jobs might use words such as incredible, extraordinary, awesome, amazing, revolutionary. Now, we can disagree with him. We can say his language was over the top. We can even call it all hype if we want. But one thing you got to give him, Steve Jobs believed in what he said. He was sincere. He was authentic. And the point here is not for us to be like Steve Jobs, but to find our own level of passion and bring that honest enthusiasm out in our work for the world to see. Now, I speak a lot about this in my course on uh, media training for the culinarian because when you get on camera, you have to elevate it a little bit more than what you normally would think. Not too much so it's kind of like distracting, but you do have to put some emphasis in there. And I give a lot of tips and tre techniques on how you can do that. But another thing he talks about is be positive. Another point he makes is be positive, upbeat, and humorous. Now, Steve Jobs, as we all know, was a very serious person, but he was also very enthusiastic. But he was also very enthusiastic because he really believed in his content. He was upbeat and positive about the future, even in bad times. And you cannot fake this. You must believe in your content or you cannot sell it. Jobs also brought a little humor to his tasks. Now, this doesn't mean telling jokes. The humor must be a little bit more subtle than that. Another point he talked about is numbers, because numbers just go glaze people right over. It's really about what the numbers mean, and we have to, as effective presenters or communicators, get that point across. It isn't always about what the numbers mean, rather than numbers themselves. So your cholesterol is 199, the national average, right? Maybe you say that, you put a number out there. Well, was that good or is that bad? Is that up or is that down? Is that average healthy or unhealthy? And what is that compared to? So when you give a number, and that could be, you know, when you're talking to your students about, you know, uh, a certain percentage, certain points, talking about income statements, you're talking about uh, in sanitation, uh, temperatures and stuff like that. Those numbers, they all just kind of mush together and it makes it very, very confusing. So what you got to do is say, what do they mean? When Steve Jobs talked about numbers in his keynotes, he would often break them down. For example, 20% market share. Well, what does that mean? If he just said that, people are like, well, okay, what does that mean? And where is that? Is that good? Is that bad? In and of itself, it doesn't mean much, right? But the meaning becomes clear when compared to others, you know, in the field of phones or whatever. So he might say something like, uh, 4 million iPhones were sold, which is the equivalent of 20,000 per day since the units went on sale. So you see how he's taking, you know, maybe that 20% of the market share wasn't really good when they first introduced it, the iPhone or something. But when he says 4 million, 20,000 per day, you know, those are painting pictures in the audience's mind that they can grasp. And now it shows meaning instead of it just being a number on its own. He also said, make it visible. 
He also said, make it visual. Jobs used huge screens and large, high-quality graphics, and the image were always very clear and professional, and they were unique. You know, they weren't from a template, right? Charts and graphs are simple and, and beautifully clear is what you need to do. If you're going to put those up there, you can't cram all kinds of numbers in it. People are trying to figure out what they mean. They got to be simple, and they got to be very, very clear. No death by bullet point, right? And Jobs, he always used the screens to show visual material. And only occasionally for, dis, you know, he used those. And they were usually there. And he used the screen to show visuals, beautiful visuals, right? And the visual material. And he only occasionally did this. And it was only used for displaying emphasis, right? So it's really about you as the talker. But you can put those in there. They do help make your point. And again, he always displayed data in a way that the meaning was very, very clear. So think about what you're putting on the screen. He also introduced something expected. He also always introduced something unexpected. His presentations always had something new, but he was always, he always surprised the audiences just a little bit each time because humans love the unexpected. And we can do this as teachers, right? We can put things into our presentations that, you know, surprise our students, which then, you know, makes them connect because we, as humans, we love some element that makes us go, wow, or oh, geez. You know, the brain loves novelty and the unexpected. So if you can build that in there, that's a great thing to do. And in, but with that said, the other thing Jobs talked about is include only what is necessary. He separated his talks into clear sections. Usually, as I mentioned, no more than three, three or four sections. And he made a clear decision not to include too much. And we can do that too. And as teachers, we sometimes are guilty of overloading our students, we put too much content in there. Again, we, you cannot say everything. You must choose what is most important for now and leave the rest out for another day. Most presentations that fail do so because they include too much information or they display it in a cluttered way that does not engage the brain. It gets overload, and then it shuts them down, and they stop paying attention. Also, vary the pace and change techniques. Steve Jobs was good at varying the pace from fast to slow and changing the flow by using different techniques. He did not stand in one place and lecture, which is a very, very bad way to present. Instead, he mixed in video clips and images and stories and data, brought in different speakers, and he did demonstrations live of the hardware and the software that he was talking about. Just talking about information for one or two hours is much too boring for the audience and for the presenter, for that matter. If the talk is only about information and, say, new features with this phone, it would be much more efficient to give that information out in a paper to read, right? So if you're presenting, you're doing something. It's a show, right? So it's got to be more than just plain information. Let that be read in the textbook by the student. You're there to present something in and above or in a different way that makes it easier to understand. Also, he always said, save the best for last. People will assess your performance in the first two minutes. So you have to start strong, but you also have to finish even stronger. People best remember the first part and the last part of your presentation. Now, the middle stuff is important, of course, but if you blow it at the start or at the end, all could be lost. This is why you have to rehearse your opening and your closing so much, right? The middle, you can kind of, that's where you can do your improvisation, right? You can ad lib, you can change it around based on your audience, but you have to have that good opening and that good closing. Jobs, he was famous for always saying, oh, and one more thing slide, where he saved the best for last. After it appeared, he had actually finished his presentations, right? Then he'd always add that in. So we want to save that. And that's where we do the kind of the wrap up. So get him at the beginning to hook him, tell him the information. And then at the end, you need to have that good close so that they remember and what, what you want them to walk away with. And with that said, his last point he talked about was go the appropriate length. Jobs never included unnecessary details, and he always made it a point to finish on time, which is what all good, effective presenters do, right? We know this as teachers because we have bells, right? Bells, and they got to get to another class, or the course is over, so we have to really watch our time. But some presenters, you know, they kind of lose track of time, you know, graduation speakers and things along that line. 
Jobs, he was aware that his presentations cannot go on too long and he must get to the point smoothly and quickly. If you cannot explain your topic and how it is important and interesting and meaningful in say 20 minutes or less, then you do not know your topic well enough. Try to make your talks or presentations or lectures as short as possible while still making the content meaningful. Keeping in mind that every case is different. Who's your audience, right? The key is not to fill your audience up. You want to leave them wanting a little bit more. All right. So as we've just learned from Sir Ken Robinson and Steve Jobs, effective presentations are the result of proper preparation. Ineffective presentations, on the other hand, are a result of poor planning or in the misguided idea that one can fake it. Well, you cannot fake it. You cannot wing it, right? Just go in there blind and say, oh, I'll just, you know, depend on what I know and I'll just speak off the cuff. It doesn't work. Going naked and engaging naturally with an audience does not mean approaching the task in a nonchalant or cavalier fashion. Ironically, without proper preparation of your material, you will not be able to be your natural self. And that's because you're going to be disorganized. You're going to be uncertain. You're going to be anxious in spite of your best efforts to show otherwise in front of your audience. An audience can easily pick up on your lack of preparation. And this is going to harm your ability to connect, right? Because they're not going to think you're credible. They're going to say, why are we wasting our time here? You do not have to be perfect in your presentation. I mean, we're all imperfect by nature and audiences understand that and they can forgive a few minor glitches. However, audiences are not forgiving or our students if they sense you have not properly prepared or if you have not specifically prepared for them and instead pulled out a canned presentation. I mean, you know, sitting in lectures before as students and our students are going through this now and they know that it's just a, and it could be something they could read. It was a canned presentation, old yellowed notes that have probably been given a million times. You didn't tailor it specific for that audience. People are going to pick up on that. So in conclusion, progress is being made on the presentation front. I mean, organizations such as the TED Talks have proven the value and the influence that a well-crafted and engaging presentation can have on an audience to teach, to persuade, to inspire, right? However, on the whole, the majority of presentations in business and academia today are still mind-numbingly dull, tedious affairs that fail to connect and engage audiences, even though the content may be important. It's just the way it's being presented. We as teachers have important ideas that are worth sharing. If we want to be more effective in the classroom, then how we present ourselves in our ideas matters a great deal. We need to create and deliver presentations that appeal to both logic and emotion. And if we use multimedia or other forms of visuals in our presentations, they must be well thought out and have been designed according to fundamental design principles, not the old tired template cliches. Now, this may take some time, but it is doable. Give it some thought. And the next time you make a presentation or begin a lecture in your classroom, why not be a little different and present naked? And if you give it a try, let me know how it works out. I would love to hear about it. You can always reach me through email at foodmedianetwork at gmail.com or even leave me a voicemail at area code 207-835-1275. Okay, that's all the time we have for this episode of The Chef Educator. Until we meet again, keep learning, keep teaching, and keep cooking. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.